I V M. Welcome to episode 67 of the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast. This is your host DJ from London and I've got Ashwin with me this week and for the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to talk a little about a tournament that's had everything. A tournament that had a slow start, a few upsets along the way and a thrilling marathon final where the two competitors just could not be separated except via a random tiebreaker. Also a tournament that was finally won by the world number one. You've got it. We're going to talk to you about Wimbledon, guys. So here we are on Edges and Sledges. Of course we're not. Of course we're not. We're going to talk about the World Cup. But guys, Ashwin, where do we start? Where do we start with the World Cup? How are you feeling? i uh, overwhelmed, still reeling a little bit. I don't even know what to, to do. What an incredible Sunday we had for sport. You mentioned Wimbledon, but it's worth calling out, right? Unbelievable final uh, Federer versus Djokovic, just an incredible game. But then obviously the World Cup, 102 overs, couldn't separate the sides, managed to finally separate them on a technicality. I mean, just so much emotion. What a, We talk, honestly, during test matches and on the show, we use the expression emotional roller coaster a little bit, but it's never really been one like like yesterday or like the Cricket World Cup final. So just unbelievable. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. There's so much to talk about. I mean, I started making a list of notes for this show, right? And it's a day, it's 24 hours after the final concluded. Our heart rates have all come down finally. We made a conscious decision, actually, not to record on the day of the final, uh, just so that we kind of look things in the cold light of day. But, uh, I mean, let's start right from the top, right? England versus New Zealand. Kane Williamson won the toss and decided to bat on, uh, on at Lord's big occasion. They say win the toss bat first. Kane did exactly that. Nichols got 55. Latham got 47. Williamson and Extras actually both got 30 each. And there wasn't much acceleration at the end. Plunkett once again picked up three wickets. Wokes again was very good for England. So 241 in the first innings of a, of a World Cup final. Ashwin, at that stage, what were you thinking? Where, where where was the final going for you at that stage, at the halfway mark? Honestly, any other time I would have said, obviously, England's game, easy to chase down 241. I think what we learned from the semi-final, which we're going to talk about in the second half of the show, is that Kane Williamson and the New Zealand setup have this ability to read the pitch brilliantly. And people miss it, but Williamson early on, early on said 250-ish would be good on this track. So, you know, maybe 10 runs short of par, but certainly not, the 300, 350, 400 run wickets that we expected. So just unbelievable. I think 241 runs, really, really good total. I mean, obviously not a slam dunk, but right down the middle, right where Williamson would have wanted to be. And Varun, Varun's just joined us as well. I, I think he's uh, had a bit of a sore head and he's a bit ill, but thanks for joining us, Varun. How did you feel about the first innings from New Zealand? 241, was that, was that enough for you? I thought, yeah, I thought it was very slow to be honest. But in the end, it turns out. In hindsight, it turns out Williamson and Ross Taylor batted extremely well. So it was frustrating watching them. But after the game, you kind of looked back and thought, "Wow, that was pretty good batting, actually." Yeah. So two forty one to get, and England come out to bat. The massive kind of opening partnership, Besto and Roy. If they got away quickly, the game could have been over in no time, right? But the first ball, DRS comes into play, Roy gets struck on the pad and I was sitting there and I was giving that out. It turned out that it was umpire's call and the umpire's call was not out at that stage. Ashwin, your thoughts on that little piece of luck, the first piece of luck that went in England's way in the final? To be honest, I almost forgot about that one because it was the first out of so, so many that until you brought it up again, I I'd completely erased it from my memory. I remember watching it 5.30 a.m. my time in my half-awake state, thinking this has got to be gone for sure. Another umpiring howler. I mean, umpire's call, fine, you'll go either way. We can have a whole separate episode about the umpire's call and whether it should exist or not. But yeah, like like you said, one the first of many, many, many pieces of luck England had. So I think that was probably a sign of what was to come for England uh, later in the day. 
Yes, yeah, so it, it, I mean, maybe some things are just destined to happen, right? And with Roy being given not out, there was already that feeling, is England destined to win this World Cup? But he didn't actually trouble the scorers that much more. He got out fairly cheaply after that. And it was a lovely spell from Matt Henry and Bolt. Their opening spells were bang on target. They didn't let England get away. Root looked uncomfortable. And then the Grandom came on and he troubled the batsman as well. Root looked in all sorts and under pressure and he got out. And then Captain Morgan came in and we were like, is, is he going to pull a Dhoni? Is he going to win a home World Cup by playing a captain's innings? And he played a horrendous shot. And Lockie Ferguson pulled out a blinder of a catch, right? At uh, the deep cover boundary, diving forward. And uh, Jimmy Nisham, who was a bowler, couldn't even believe it. And then came the important partnership. The partnership that changed the course of the match in some ways. And that's Butler and Besto. And Varun, I want to come to you for this because I know you've been going on for almost a year about the importance of the middle order in a World Cup. And I sent you something about how Dhoni and Yuvraj were in their pomp in 2011, which is when India won the World Cup. And Butler and, and, and Butler, it, it wasn't actually Butler and Besto, I apologize, it's Butler and Stokes, right? It's uh, Butler and Stokes. That partnership put England right back on on track um, as well. And Besto got out before that. But what is the importance of the middle order in, in a World Cup, Varun? Yeah, DJ, so we, we've said it before, right? We've said it at the start of our podcast and many episodes in as well. I think a long tournament is won by your number five, six and seven. And the scary thing about England is each one of their players in these positions are match winners. I remember when Morgan got out and Butler came in, I remember texting a friend of mine saying that the problem with this English team is that Butler can single-handedly win you this game. He just needs people to stick on the other end. So I think from that perspective, it just gives us a little bit of an insight into how good um, England's 5-6-7 are and in general, how important 5-6-7 are for... And, and we saw that, right? We saw that with both Australia and India in the semi-finals, that when your middle order was not solid, you've kind of lost the game. Very true, very true. So so let's come to Stokes, Ashwin. You need 22 of 9. New Zealand have stayed in the game. They've kept taking wickets. They've got Wokes. They've got Butler. But Ben Stokes is still out there. You need 22 of 9. Stokes smashes one of Jimmy Neesham to the deep mid-wicket boundary almost. And Trent Bolt is under there. And it's gone up. And he comes under it. He takes the catch. He looks back for a split second and his foot is already on the boundary. That second piece of luck, Ashwin, how how big was that, particularly in the context of the catch that Paul took earlier in the tournament to dismiss Prattwit, which was one of the reasons why New Zealand actually ended up making it into the semi-final. How big was that six slash catch? Yeah, it's pretty incredible. When, when you think about... New Zealand path journey to get here. There was two games with incredibly fine margins. First against West Indies that helped them make sure they sealed the number four spot. And second against India that got them to the final. And so unfortunately, in the final itself, that incredibly fine margin went the opposite direction and went in India's favor. But I think exactly to your point, a lot of people are saying that bolt catch that was instead of six was the defining moment of the match. I mean, I think before the match, if you are telling me it's 22 of nine, there's a shot that hits, that's hit to the boundary. You have to have one fielder that you could have there. I may have picked Trent Bolt. I mean, from across the globe, there's Maxwell and others, but from New Zealand, you would have backed Trent Bolt. He's done it time and time again for New Zealand. For Delhi, in fact, he's done it. He's just an exceptional boundary fielder. You know, I'm now at the point, like I'm sure many of our listeners are, where I've watched the last, call it three overs on the super over, probably four times now from start to finish. And I realize... There was a lot of grass behind Bolt and the rope was pulled in just a little. So as you were thinking of his peripheral vision and his judgment, he he thought he had a couple more steps to go. And that's why he he took the catch, took one step back and then tried to release the ball. But it was one step too many and that cost him. Uh, there was a bit of a Freudian slip there, Ashwin, that I noticed where he said the luck went in India's favor in the final. But we'll, we'll move on from that very quickly. <laughs> Maybe I'm just still dreaming. Maybe that's what I'm still hoping for. Yeah. I, of course, meant England, but in my heart, I'm still hoping India was playing the final. Absolutely, absolutely. And we'll come to that in the second half of the show. Not to worry, there'll be plenty of India chat. But New Zealand's fielding throughout the tournament, right? I mean, it's been incredible with that throw from Guptill, the catching, the catching even in the final under pressure, the run out. I mean, we're, we're going to come all to all of that later, but I just thought it was fantastic. Plus, 
guptal sportsmanship in signaling that a six immediately on the field. There was no need to go to DRS. There was no need to go to the uh, third umpire or anything. He caught the ball off Bolt and said, yeah, mate, that's gone for six. So the, he signaled six to the umpire and that was that. So it goes to twen- from 22 for nine. The equation comes down to nine of three all of a sudden, right? And then you have the shot that Stokes kind of bunts out of Bolt into the outfield and cupped it again, picks up the ball, throws it in. And this is the big talking point. And we're going to kind of deep dive into this. It hits the middle of Stokes' bat while he's diving full length to get back into his crease at the striker's end and deflects away for four runs. So that's definitely four, according to the rules of the game. There's no problem with that. I mean, incredibly bad luck at that stage of a game, I would say. I mean, it, it's a rare thing to happen that it actually goes off the bat or the batsman's body for four. It's happened. There was no malice from Stokes. But Ashwin Varun, should it have been five? There's been a lot of chat about that in the media. There's a lot of rules that have been brought out. MCC's law 19.8 has been brought out in red. And I think I'm convinced it should have been five. Ashwin? I think I now am convinced that it should have been five as well. But you have to cut some slack to the, for the umpires. It's incredibly difficult. I think if the, the technicality of the rule that would have made it five is you give the batsman as many runs as had been completed at the time the fielder released the ball. Just think about it. That means you're expecting the umpire to watch exactly when the fielder releases the ball and be watching for runouts and be watching for a short run, etc. It's nearly impossible to see. Maybe they should have gone up to the third umpire given how close this game was at the time. I think all around just a freak situation because if you're saying the umpire should have predicted that this may have happened and thus been watching when the fielder released the ball, then there's absolutely no way that could have happened. So again, the second out of many crazy, crazy freak chances that went in England's favor. But I, I don't think the umpires could have done anything. But I do agree with you. It probably should have been five in the grand scheme of things. Why didn't they go up? I mean, they go up for the smallest of stuff um, today. Like any run out, any stumping. When we're watching on TV, we can see it's probably not out. But they still go up. So I just cannot understand that in a World Cup final, how can you not go up for this? My honest opinion on that, Varun, I think is that they just didn't know what the law said. Because... If this was being played on a Sunday in a club game and someone was running to the uh, striker's end where you haven't got the benefit of slow motion replays and stuff where it's being released. I mean, in in normal motion, I didn't even think twice about it. I just thought it was extremely, extremely bad luck. I was like, I wasn't aware of the rule myself, to be honest, that they'd have to have crossed before the ball is released for the run to count. I mean, it, there was a lot of pressure. It's a World Cup final. But to my mind, actually going up wasn't my first reaction to that. My first reaction to all of that was, oh my God, how bad can your luck be in a, in a World Cup final for it to deflect off the batsman and go away for four? So, yeah, I totally get where you're coming from. And yes, this is international cricket where you do have the benefit of technology. But maybe it just got lost in the in the whole grand scheme of things and the pressure. But, but do you, do, I mean, obviously the boundary affected, made made things easier for England. But... Do you think that the one extra run actually affected the outcome of the match? I mean, I when you look at it in hindsight, I do, right? Because you, you basically tied the game for super over and without that one run. Now, it's a very simplistic way of looking at it. But I do think that um, if, if they had just gotten two instead of four, instead of six, sorry, there was a four run deficit and that would have been game changing. So... Yes, I do believe it. Ashwin, do you think that they would have played differently if they needed three of the last ball instead of two of the last ball? Maybe Stokes would have tried to put that one, that full toss on leg stump away on the last ball instead of bunting it down the ground and trying to get two? Yeah, not just may have may they have batted differently, but the field may have been different. Bolt may have bowled a different delivery. He may not have gone for the low full toss. So it's, it's impossible to say what would have happened. I think people are oversimplifying when they say, oh... The scores were tied, which means if they got five runs instead of six, New Zealand would have won. Exactly to your point, when you need four of two or three of the last delivery, you react differently. So I don't, I don't think we can say England didn't deserve to at least get the tie. It's amazing how many angles that people have come at that one ball from. I mean, what a moment in a World Cup final. Suddenly from, like, you've gone from seven of two to you suddenly go to three of two. And, I mean, it could have even been... Eight of two. Although that said, if 
it hadn't gone for four, Stokes would have got uh, the second run, right? So it would have been it would have been seven of two, which is a totally different dynamic to three of two. But one last question on this same ball for you. I know I've I've I've, I've stayed on it for for quite a long time, but does the rule need changing? Varun, to your mind, should it, if it hits the batsman, be a dead ball? I mean, batsmen typically don't run after it's hit them because it's considered against the spirit of the game because, I mean, it's deflected off them and gone away from a fielder who would ordinarily be backing up. But do you think that the rule should actually be brought in to make it a dead ball? I do think so, man. I think so also because just look at how this has changed the entire course of the game. I think uh, you... You know, Ben Stokes also was sitting with his hands up. He didn't know about it. And talk about luck. The only part of the field where there was no fielder there, it's gone there. So, I mean, yes, you're right. If it had hit them and ricocheted off and there was an opportunity for a single, the batsman probably wouldn't have run. But in this situation, they just got extra four. So, yes, I do think it should be called a dead ball or it should be, well, you've completed this run, you can't run anymore. So, some, something on those lines. I mean, we have to think about it more, but I think this is just unfair the way it is right now. Very interesting. Ashwin, I'm go- I know I said it was the last question, but I want one more reaction from you. How would Kohli or Steve Smith or Aaron Finch have reacted if that had happened to them in a World Cup final? You mean as the fielding captain? Absolutely, as the fielding captain. It's unbelievable, right? Completely different to Kane Williamson, just completely different personalities. I think we would have lost about 10 minutes with Kohli arguing with the umpires. Maybe Shastri would have gone to the fourth official. It would have just been pandemonium if India was fielding, or even same with Australia, if Australia was fielding. To be totally honest, Morgan's a good guy, but I think if England was fielding and that happened while New Zealand was batting and it went off, say, Ross Taylor's back to the boundary, you have to believe the Stokes and Roy's of the world would have been arguing and shouting and screaming about it. So Williamson's just a good guy, and in this case, like they say, nice guys finish last. Yeah, I can see Kohli just calling out Ben Stokes and Mark Stokes' name again and again. But Varun, your thoughts on this point? Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I can totally hear Kohli shouting Ben Stokes at Ben Stokes. So, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure how that would work, but yeah. Oh, what fun and games. But I mean, so much to talk about from that one delivery. But anyway, so it came down to three of two and... Wow, so we we still haven't got to the Super Over yet and bold bowls to really nice deliveries and there are two runouts and New Zealand have actually kept their nerve to and one of the runouts, I mean, Bolt has just picked one up off the half volley and taken the stumps out. If he's missed that, that is the game right there almost. So it goes into a Super Over. The Super Over, Butler and Stokes come out again. The heroes for England with the bat in the second innings somehow managed to smash their way to 15 of the super over, right? Bold by Trent Bold, who went to his Yorkers again. At that stage, guys, who were you backing? Varun, tell me honestly, who were you backing at that stage? Man, at that stage, I don't know. I, I think I was, I was backing, I still was backing England at that point. I just kind of had this feeling that England is going to take it. Ashwin, was it the right combination? So I think Stokes and Butler are the right combination. I think there's a whole separate debate going on about should the team that batted second in the match get to bat first in the super over I think it's fair given that one you know, they've already chased so now let the other team chase etc you have to back Butler anytime and you have to back Stokes even though he was exhausted he, he had the momentum he was on the field he was fully warmed up so right combination and I think any day your team would take 15 in a super over any day we've seen super overs one with nine and ten runs was it the right combination for New Zealand to come out? Martin Guptill, who's hardly scored any runs this entire World Cup, and Jimmy Neesham. Ashwin? I, I think maybe, maybe you could have promoted Colin de Grandom. He was standing on the boundary rope, padded up, so he was ready to come in at the fall of a wicket. I mean, man, it's so it's so difficult to make these calls. I think they I think they made the right call on paper. Guptill, it's not you don't need him to go out there and make two hundred. You need him to make contact twice. And I think on paper he's your man to do it. I think they backed Nisham because it's a left-hander, and so they got the access to the short boundary with him. He did hit. A, he did hit a six. He's been in pretty good form. So it was they had the right three guys. Arguably, maybe you could have sent De Grand Home ahead of Gupta. And that over from Jofra Archer. I mean, incredible pressure for a 24-year-old. I think it was so good for uh, for him to have been given that that super over and the confidence shown in him saying. Yeah, you're 24 year old, but but we think you can deliver this for us. And for the pressure on Jofra Archer, who's remember he's come into this England setup only a couple of months ago. 
for him to take that pressure and to deliver that ball to Guptil where they need, incredibly, the equation had come down to three of two and then two of one, very, very much like what had happened to England in their innings. And he delivers that Yorker, Guptil digs it out, it goes out to deep mid-wicket where Roy is the fielder who's actually already misfielded twice and thrown once at the wrong end in the same super over. This time he makes no mistake, picks it up, flings it in to Josh Butler. Guptil, one of the fastest runners in the New Zealand team, and I think Kane Williamson makes a joke about this as well. He is miles out. He's not even in the frame, but he's diving. He's hoping somehow, and Josh Butler collects it, takes the stumps out, and England have got their first ever World Cup by virtue of having hit more boundaries during the course of the match. Congratulations to England, but the natural question turns up because the scores were tied because they each scored 15 runs again. Is the boundary rule too arbitrary, guys? Is is there a better way of awarding a World Cup? Should it have been shared? Ashwin, your thoughts go wild. Yes, I think it's arbitrary. Yes, I think it should have been shared or there has to have been a better way to do it. I mean, the, the analogy they draw is like a penalty shootout in soccer. If you get five kicks each and there's no the team hasn't one team hasn't gone ahead, then you don't go back and say, okay, which team gave more corner kicks or which team got more yellow cards or something obscure about what happened in the 90 minutes. I think you keep going, and when you have a winner, you have a winner. So I think it either should have been shared or there should have been some other way of determining it. But I want to caveat the 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 one thing I said to you guys when we were chatting earlier before the show. These were the rules at the time of the start of the match. These were the rules at the time of the start of the Super Over you know, the broadcasters put it up saying, here's how the super over works. If you lose a wicket, one more guy comes in. And then the last point on that list was, if the super over is tied, then it, the winner is the team that scored more boundaries at the uh, during the course of the game. So the commentators and the broadcasters were very clear that New Zealand needs 16 runs to win. The team knew that as well. So I, I think it's it's an unfortunate rule. We should go back in hindsight and change it, and the ICC should... Definitely address it and do something to change it. But it was the rule at the time of the start of the match. It was the rule at the time of the start of the Super Over, and that is what it is. Varun, your suggestions on breaking a tie? I know you sent us something earlier. Do you want to tell our listeners about it? Yeah, I mean, hitting the number of boundaries is almost as good as doing tip-top, right? It was what we used to do in India because we didn't have a coin. And so we would each come with our you know feet in a line, and whoever's foot reached the other person's foot faster one that particular toss if you had if you said it so to me it was absolutely ridiculous why boundaries why not wickets new zealand took more wickets than um, than england did so um, you know especially when you saw some of those early boundaries from besto and roy which were a lot of some were edges some were very lucky it puts things into perspective right that if you if you nick it and, you, and it's missed your stumps but it's gone to the boundary ultimately that has helped in a you know that has helped in the winning result so I think it's ridiculous. I don't know what the suggestion is. I think you know a lot of people are saying the World Cup could have been shared. Why not? But I, I think to determine it like this is just heartbreaking. I agree. It was an absolutely incredible end. I, I, I'm with Ashwin that both teams knew the rules. New Zealand knew they needed to get 16. It's not something that they're thinking about the number of boundaries that they've hit right during the course of the game. But... I mean, in some weird way, it it does reward England's strategy of playing aggressively and hitting boundaries and all of that. So, I mean, rules are rules, right? And remember, it was a, a, a quirk of the rules that actually helped New Zealand actually get into the semi-finals with the net run rate being used instead of head-to-head. If head-to-head had been used, Pakistan would actually be in the semi-finals. And who knows, India would have probably beaten Pakistan as usual and we would have steamrolled England casually picked up the trophy and uh, chilled out at Lords. But hey-ho, that is that is life. And um, yeah, here we are. England are world champions, deservedly so, I think. Number one team in the world. Um, there will be talk. There may be people trying to put an asterisk next to it. But at the end of the day, people are going to say in the scorebook, it does say England won a World Cup. And yeah, that's really... All that matters for people who are looking in the scorebook. For us, I think Kane Williamson and his New Zealand team were mm-hmm. equally worthy of being champions. And I think they won a lot of hearts with their display after all the luck went against them. Right. So, guys, the other thing I wanted to talk about, 
Sorry, Ashwin, we got something to add to that. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to say is that, you know, a lot of people will put the asterisk. A lot of people will say, oh, New Zealand deserves to share, etc. I think we have to just step back and appreciate the game we had as a whole. Like we've gone into every little detail. We've dissected it. We've been talking about it. The whole, all newspapers, I think the BBC released a stat that their the cricket uh, summary page got the most <clears throat> got the most views or visits more than the FIFA World Cup finals more than anything else so I just think we need to step back as fans and advocates of the game and say it was an in- absolutely incredible final well fought we can dispute the final result we can dispute the laws of the game which we will do in in a lot of depth but I think just an incredible advert for the for the game really really thrilled that this was our World Cup final for 2019. Varun, is this the greatest World Cup final ever and the greatest one-day international ever? It's definitely the greatest World Cup final ever. I was thinking about the 99 World Cup, Australia, Pakistan. I remember falling asleep many times during that uh, during that particular match. That was a pretty so short th- nap then because I think they scored like 120 or something. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. But because of the timing, I kept waking up and sleeping. Um, so this was definitely the most, the, the best World Cup final. I, I don't know, man. In terms of World Cup games, I would... Yeah, I think it was. I, I think we were discussing the Australia-South Africa semi-final in 99. This may have even trumped that. So, it, it had everything. So, yeah, it was a great game. Ashwin, is this the greatest one-day international ever played in the history of the game? I think the adrenaline and the, the rush that we're feeling right now makes me want to say yes. I think it's definitely one of the top five. We've been fortunate in our sport to have so many great games, but definitely right up there. I just think the the game was so incredible. And I think this is actually the greatest one day international ever played and I'm not sure we're going to see anything better than this because you know we have watched so much cricket and we're used to seeing one team or the other actually crack under the pressure and fail to deliver at a clutch moment I mean this was a game where you had them tied after 102 overs they were still tied and they I mean incredible I've, I've never seen anything like that the fielding was as good as it. There were there were runouts on the last ball of the war final. There were runouts on the last two balls of New Zealand of England's innings, and the pressure, the immense pressure of a tournament that comes around once every four years, for these two teams to not take a backward step, and not worry about the final analysis and just produce that level of cricket, I just think it's it is absolutely incredible, and I I genuinely think we're not going to see another one day international better than that and if we do it would have to be something that's got a better script than that because even like Srini Mama couldn't write a better script than that man honestly anyway so I want to talk a little about Ben Stokes he was the man of the final deservedly so Um, has he redeemed himself in the eyes of the public Ashwin has he he completely come out of the issues that he had last year with the uh, bar fight and stuff. I think so, but it's it, let's start a little bit fi- behind that. In 2015, he got dropped, right? Didn't play the 2015 World Cup on form. 2016, T20s came back, and obviously we know what happened in the last over, got hit for four sixes. So this is a guy who's shown incredible fight. You know, we've make, made fun of him on the show before, got into a bar fight, got into a street fight. It was very interesting because he said before the World Cup, he said to a, a journalist at some point, he said, I don't want my legacy to be oh, that guy who got into a fight on the street. I want my legacy to be the, uh, a World Cup champion or a world champion. And he's done it, right? It was not an easy situation when he came into bat. Varun mentioned this about middle order. It was a very tricky situation when he came into bat and he pulled out all the stops for his team. So full credit where it's due. I think he's erased whatever old tips exist. I think we reserve the right to still make fun of him. But I think he's redeemed himself uh, in a huge way. Varun, is he gone from zero to hero in your eyes? Yeah, I think so. I think a lot of people had uh, had for- forgotten about the last year's incident. I think public memory is short. But I think doing this is absolutely fantastic. More than the, the bar fight, etc. I was thinking about that World T20 final where he gave 24 runs. And to come back in a World Cup final like this, I, I mean, that is that is just spectacular. And if you think about it, just before Archer went into bowl, that final super over, I think that's what Ben Stokes went to tell him, that whatever you do, this this over will not define your career because it's happened to me before. Yeah, absolutely fantastic scenes. And he actually, yeah, Jofra actually said that that's what Ben Stokes said to him. And I mean, 
Cricket loves a good redemption story, man. And if there were ever a redemption story from a man who was about to be jailed for Afre, facing trial in while India were here last year, to suddenly becoming a world champion, I was just hoping that Ian Bishop would somehow just come out and start screaming, "Ben Stokes, remember the name, remember the name." But obviously, that didn't happen. <laughs> So, so guys, the the last point on the World Cup final was the choice of man of the tournament. Williamson got it for his five hundred and seventy eight runs in the course of the tournament, and you saw that video where he looked really surprised that it was him, and he was like, "Me, me," and I mean, everyone like was completely uh, in love with that video and stuff. But the question to my mind is: Was he the right person to get it? Or were there other people who deserved it more? And I'm going to put two names out there. I'm going to go with Shakib from Bangladesh for his runs and wickets in unfamiliar conditions, and of course Rohit Sharma for his five centuries, which no man has ever achieved before in the history of World Cup cricket. Varun, or I would say Mitchell Stark, who's got the most number of World Cup wickets in this tournament. Yeah, that's another contender for it. So, Varun, what are your thoughts on on Kane Williamson winning the? Man of the tournament. I mean, yes, sportsman like, great batsman, amazing leader. But was that de- decision maybe driven a little bit by the emotion of the moment, or was it taken in uh, in the cold light of day, maybe previously? I think it was definitely driven by the emotion. Uh, the emotion in the moment. I don't. I think we talk. You mentioned three players who all were more deserving candidates. I believe Rohit Sharma, Shakib, and Mitchell Stark. And so, personally, I was very confused. I remember waking up and seeing Williamson got man of the series, and I and the first thing I thought was, okay, it's like a consolation prize, or you know, these guys have given it to him for his leadership, but that's something that's not very measurable. Like you know, it's not tangible enough to say that his leadership was good. So yes, if we've had situations where the winning teams have not had, uh, you know, the man of the series is, does not come from the winning team. We've seen that in two thousand three, where Sachin got it, and he ended up on the losing side. Um, same thing happened in 2019, but I I was genuinely a bit confused as to why Williamson got it. Ashwin, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I'm on the other side of this argument actually. So I looked back at all the history of the man of the series, or player of the tournaments, and there's every single incident except one. The player of the tournament came from one of the two's finalists. Okay, so to me that sort of eliminates Shakib. He had an absolutely outstanding tournament. Nobody can take that away from him. But your team didn't make it to the semis, and so for me that, you know, if you, I, I get it, he doesn't have as strong a team playing behind him. But if your team doesn't get to the semis, I don't think you can be player of the tournament. There's one exception to in 1999, uh, to, uh, which is Lance Klusner, so the South African all rounder. He made 280 runs, took 17 wickets. He was given player of the tournament despite not being able to get his side to the final. But we know how that semi final went, right? If anything, that. ODI may be just as epic, if not a little bit more epic than this one. Every other time, the player of the tournament has come from one of the two winning sides. So if you think about the players across England and New Zealand, I mean, you had a, a Root, Roy, and Bairstow who were all in the top 10 run scorers and Stokes now. You know, fine, but nobody really stood out or did anything exceptionally different. You could argue maybe Archer, but again, he you know wasn't as consistent. He was he ended third on the list of wickets, but was expensive at times. I think Williamson was a logical choice. He was fourth on the highest run scorers list, five hundred and seventy eight, averaged more than eighty. In in many cases, single handedly got his team to victory. And I think you have to factor in his leadership as well, which is a little bit intangible, but I think he deserved it. So the long and short of it is, I think it was a fair fair pick. Very interesting. So. I think I fall somewhere in between the two of your schools of thought where, I mean, Shakib is a great player, had a great tournament, uh, but he wasn't part of a very strong team. So uh, I guess my vote would have probably gone for him more than anything else, given that it was all down to him to try and perform. And he was bowling, remember, in not very spin-friendly conditions and his batting as well. I mean, incredible batsmanship in, in conditions which are not easy to bat in. So... And he still scored more runs than a lot of people, although these were just in the group stages. So I would have probably gone with, with Chucky, but I totally see why Williamson also got it. Along with the man of the series, I think they should give him a, a sainthood, which, uh, I mean, for his reaction and his his absolute gentlemanly behavior, I think the New Zealand team have won more fans in that one game than any other game they've played in, in the last, since whenever they've been playing cricket. I mean... 
incredible, incredible scenes and an incredible match. And yeah, I think I'm getting emotional thinking of it again. So before I get too emotional, we're going to take a very quick break and we're going to be back after the break talking about the Indian exit from the World Cup and all the heartbreak that went with it. Guys, stick around. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be emotional. It's going to be fun. So stick around and we'll be back straight after this break. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you are not following us on social media, please make sure you do. We're IVM Podcasts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Do remember that if you enjoy what you're listening to, take a screenshot, tag us on social media, and we'll repost to you on one of the platforms. Also, just, you know, shout out if you want to tell us anything about what's going on. Also, a quick reminder, we are still hiring. We're hiring in a whole bunch of different areas. If you're looking to work at what I believe is the best place on earth to work at, then you should check out our careers page. That's at IVM Podcast. On Cyrus says, journalist and news editor Maru Kinaya talks to Cyrus about the diminishing opposition in the parliament, her journey from growing up in Kashmir to studying at Harvard, her experience reporting 2611, and her podcast, The Note with Maru Kinayat. That's on the IVM Podcast Network. On paperback, Racheta and Satyajit are joined by film critic Sucharita Tyagi, who discusses the role that film reviews play and the books adapted into films. On Keeping It Queer, Naveen and Farah talk to the queer affirmative therapist from the Sahas Therapy Group, Advaita and Jagruti, about mental health in queer spaces. On the Pragati podcast, Pawan is joined by Takshashila fellow Amaya Nayak to talk about the United Nation and its role in global governance. On States of Anarchy, Hamsani's guest is author Manu Pillai. They discuss communal relations and the intersection of the foreign and domestic in Indian history. On the Filter Coffee podcast, Karthik is joined by strategy consultant Mohit Hira. They talk about the evolving brand-consumer relationship and how the concept of Eddie Tales came into being. On IVM Likes, Staffers, Abbas, Saishri and our newest producer, Shlok, are discussing the Indian version of The Office. I think you'll enjoy that. On the Habit Coach podcast, Ashton talks to one of the finest pastry chefs of India, Pooja Dhingra, where they discuss various entrepreneurial habits. On Equity Sayya, Shrey Lunkar, Senior VP and Ashish Somaya, CEO at Motilal Oswal AMC, talk to Anupam about the company's investment philosophy, how do you identify stocks and a whole lot more. And with that, let's continue on with your show. Welcome back from that break. And after that emotional final, we're go- now going to move on to a discussion about India's semi-final against New Zealand. I know it's depressing. I know it's very, very sad. I know you don't want to think about it, but we have to do it and we have to get it out of the way, right? India crashing out of this World Cup in the semi-final. In the first semi-final on Tuesday last week, it was quite unexpected especially given the total that we were meant to chase. So we're going to go through all of those points and we're going to try and figure out what went wrong. Ashwin, first up, we all thought that New Zealand batted very slowly, but did they read the pitch better than India did? I think there were so many different moving pieces, right? I think absolutely to answer your question, they read the pitch better than India did. I think it was the first in my memory, two-day international we call it an ODI, but this is a TDI, if you want to call it that. But it was a, it was a two-day international. It was played across different days. No team before has had to chase at 10.30 in the morning local time. So there were so many factors. But to answer your direct question, Ross Taylor, 74 of 90 balls with a team perform, team total of 239, in hindsight, was absolutely magical batting. Uh, do, do you think the rain that came on the first day actually interrupted our momentum? I mean, they were 211 for five, not very many overs to go. India were well on top. Do you think if we'd just chased the runs on the day, it would have been a different story altogether? I know it sounds like an excuse now, but what are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's ifs and ands, but your, your two two bits on, on it, what would have happened if the rain had stayed away? Are you asking for my bits and pieces opinion? That's going to come later in the <laughs> piece. Um, look, I think, I think, yes, in hindsight, yes. But at the time, we were all praying for more rain and hoping that India got to bat the full 50 overs. And that's because, if you remember, the target was 240 in 50 overs. That would have become 148 in 20 overs, according to Duckworth Lewis. And there were a lot of people on social media and in the news, et cetera, at the time saying, hey, what kind of math is this? How are we chasing under five and over in 50 overs or seven and a half and over for 20 overs? And so most people were saying it would be better if it rains out, start fresh, new day, new morning, come out and bat and chase 240 and 50 overs. Obviously, we know how that ended. I think in hindsight, I was, I was messaging you guys this when it happened. In hindsight, the 11 we played in the, in the semi was, is our best T20 11 as well. So, you know, if they could just figure out in the dressing room how to shift gears, 148 and 20 overs may have been pretty doable. 
Yeah, in hindsight, I don't think they were going anywhere in 20 overs. I think they scored about 65 runs in tw- the first 20 overs no, for that, the loss of four That's weekends. a different discussion because they were chasing it at 50. <laughs> but I think if, you know, honestly, if they went out with a T20 mindset to chase seven and a half and over, I mean, Rohit is a completely different T20 player. Uh, Kohli's a different T20 player. So I think they would have, would have all found their, their game. Okay, so let, let's talk about that, right? So let's talk about our chase. We come out there chasing 239. It's a mediocre score. We've just got, we've just chased 265 with ease against Sri Lanka. Rahul and Rohit making it look like, like it was nothing. Basically scoring hundreds for fun. And suddenly you've got Matt Henry who bowls that beautiful ball to, uh, um, Rohit. And Rohit, I mean, I don't think Rohit has done anything wrong at that. He has to play at it. It's curling away very, very nicely. I mean, it's a perfect ball to a top-class batsman. I genuinely don't think Rohit could have done anything else. Ashwin? Yeah, completely agree. I think Rohit got a peach of a delivery. You know, he's been in incredible form. You expect he's, he's allowed the failure. I think he's the one, he got a perfect delivery. He couldn't have done anything. I think to jump ahead, Rahul played a pretty poor shot. And Kohli actually was the most interesting to me because it was an absolutely beautifully set trap. So credit to both Williamson and to Bolt as the bowler. I'm sure they worked it together, but a beautifully set trap. And, you know, we can talk more about that. Yeah, let, let's talk about Kohli, right? Because the moment he went in the semi final, and it was very, very good bowling, it was a bit of bad luck from Kohli. On Kohli's part, the umpire gave it out. It was umpire's call. It was literally just touching the top of the bales. So, billion hearts just broke when those bales were being knocked off by the wall. And then you started seeing all these stats, funnily enough, being sent by all these Pakistani fans saying how uh, Kohli goes missing when it matters. And he scored nine in a semi-final in 2011. And then he scored uh, one in, in Australia and one in England in a semi-final. Okay, now I'm going to ask this question. I don't want to ask it because I think it's an, it's a stupid question and it's a guy who plays under immense pressure all the time. But I'm going to have to ask it because is there anything to Kohli not being able to perform under pressure, Ashwin? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say no. I think it's been probably bad luck that his few failures have come in ICC tournament semifinals, but he's played... I mean, there's so many chases from... Adelaide against Australia. To, he's just, to me, he's still the master of chases and it'll take a lot of failures to take that title away from him. So I'm not reading it too much into that one. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think Kohli, I mean, he puts his mind to something, he will do it. There's obviously a lot of pressure in him, on him all the time. I think he was set up beautifully, as you said, and got unlucky with the umpire giving him out. If the umpire hadn't given him out, it would have stayed not out even on a New Zealand review. So... It is what it is. Robert Green going New Zealand's way. And then Rahul played a pretty ordinary shot, I thought, to get out. And I mean, that's exactly what the problem was. At that stage, you're five for three. You've got DK in along with Pant, who is batting his normal position at, at four. DK fails. It's 24 for four. Pandya comes in. They steady the ship. Ashwin, I know you're going to ask this question. Where was Dhoni? That I, I was hoping you would answer that question for me. I think it's absolutely shocking and appalling and completely unacceptable that at 24 for four, um, what was it? It was about 10 overs in. You got MS Tony, a man with 10,000 plus runs, 350th ODI he was playing. And he didn't stand up, put his pads on and say, guys, I'm going to go fix this. I'm going to go steady this ship and save a Pandya and Jadeja to finish the job at the end. I think it's appalling that you sent out a Hardik Pandya who's in your team as a number seven, who's a player who's go, who goes out there to strike quickly and strike big. And Tony was sitting in the dressing room while Pandya and Pant, again, Pant also a player who's in the team for his strike rate more than his ability to anchor. I'm just shocked and appalled and I don't want to, you know, it's been long enough and I had sort of let this out of my my brain, but now as you're talking about it, it's all coming back. But just re- absolutely ridiculous to me. I don't want to put the blame on any one player. It's not Rohit's fault. It's not Kohli's fault. It's not Tony's fault in isolation. But I think just ridiculous that Tony didn't walk out at number four. So I think there's a few things there. And I've been thinking about it because I know we had a we had an exchange on this the moment it happened, right? And 
I have been thinking about it, and there's a, there's a number of issues with uh, with Dhoni simply putting his hand up and say, "Look, I'm going to go out and do the job." One, if he came out at four, what message are you sending to people like Rishabh Pant? You're just not good enough. We'll back you there in an easy situation, but when the going gets tough, we're going to pull this guy out, this 38 year old who's uh, done everything. As you say, he's played 350 plus ODIs and got 10,000 runs. He, we're going to send him out because we're not backing you. I think that that would have sent a wrong message, wrong message to the youngsters, right? I, I accept that for number four. Yeah. A, I don't think a World Cup semi-final is about sending sending messages to youngsters. A World Cup semi-final needs to be about winning. Okay, but fine. Even if you say that, he should have walked out at five. Correct. So, so, he, so, played at, he played at five for the first six matches of the tournament, then played at six for the ballot. So you've got a, you've got a confidence thing there. So you don't want to destroy other people's confidence. Then comes the issue of what is the team management looking at Dhoni's role to be? Is he out there to steady the ship? The ship had been steadied after it was twenty four for four. Pandya and Pant put their head down. They played innings, which Dhoni could have played anyway. So in the final analysis, it made no difference is what I'm saying. Yes, you're thinking of it as perhaps a defensive move. What would Dhoni have done? He would have played an innings of 30 of 60 balls, which is what Pant and Pandya did. Yeah, go on. You made, but you made Pandya play the inning of 30 of 60 yeah. when he's the guy who can come in and hit 60 of 40 at the end. But then he's set and he didn't do it. So if, but if he's not, Dhoni he's had not played the guy. same innings, would you have not criticized him for being too slow? No, because the, he, he I, I, let's get, let's go, let's come in here. <laughs> this is what he, I'm saying. It cuts made, both ways, right? He made 50 of 72 balls. Correct. So that would have been a perfect innings if he walked in at 24 for four. And made his 50 of 72 balls. But no one bit. could score the 50 of 72 balls at 24 for 4 on that I, track. That's what I I'm trying to tell you. You're, you're telling Pandya, me if, who's an attacking player, no, hold on. couldn't I, get I, the I, ball I, off the square. Hold on. If Pant could make 32 of 56, Pandya could make 32 of 62. You're telling me Dhoni couldn't have made 50 of 72 at that time? No, he couldn't. That's the whole point. Dhoni so is not the Dhoni of old where he can't... Sorry, what? Then he doesn't deserve to be in the eleven for me. If he cannot, if you have a punt who's what like ten ODIs old, Pandya, who's a number seven batsman who bowls a full quarter of ten overs and comes into hit at the end, if those guys can make thirty out of sixty balls, and you're saying Dhoni couldn't make fifty of seventy at that time, then that's fundamentally why he doesn't deserve to be in the eleven. And I, but Dhoni is a wicket keeper batsman like them. Pant is a pure batsman who's got a strike rate of above a hundred in T Twenty cricket. He's a smasher. So correct. So why? So how is he walking in and expecting to play the anchor role suddenly? But he's done the job. He's done. What I'm saying is the job was done. They had steadied the innings. No, you're looking. You're looking back and saying that. I'm saying if Dhoni came in and steadied, you gave Pandya license to accelerate with Jadeja at the end. But if Dhoni right? scored thirty of fifty-two or fifty-six or whatever Pant did. Would you not have gone after him in the same way? But what I'm saying is there are some players who are easy targets to go after because they are, they are your marquee players. I'm not going after Pants for 30 or 50 because I think he did a good job doing that. That's what you needed when you're top three mid one. Yeah, so we got that from Pant and maybe the team management backed him to do it and for Dhoni to do, do the back end instead. I, I know you and I have argued about this a lot. I don't think we'll come to any consensus. I want to say my point of view is I don't think the team management said, hey, let's back punt or hey, it's a World Cup semi-final, but we're not concerned about winning. We're concerned about punt's confidence for the future. So let's send him. No, but I you're think, sending, what I'm saying is one, that's the wrong message to send saying, no, so, so let just me just finish my thought. I, I, I'm, I'm saying, I don't think the team management cared about messages. It's a World Cup semi-final. You do what, whatever it takes to make your team win. And if they did care about messages, to me, that's flawed. So fine. I think, Dhoni did not put his hand up and want to go out to bat. And look, when in 2011, when it was convenient, he promoted himself. Eight years later in 2019, <laughs> he didn't want to show up. He demoted himself. So, and uh, it, it, it didn't work uh, out. Okay, so and I'm going to stop you there because he doesn't make these decisions anymore. He gave up the captaincy. He is not the captain anymore. In 2011, he was the captain. He put himself up, right? He did it. And I'm it just, was not I'm, convenient then. It was a difficult situation where he walked out and said, I'm going to bat above the man of the tournament. If that had gone wrong, he would have been blasted from everywhere. Yeah, I mean, fair. And again, you and I are not going to agree on Dhoni, on anything to do with Dhoni. You're, you and I are certainly not going to agree with this one. But I, I, I don't, I think if anybody thinks Dhoni is not, it's part of the decision making. What did, what did the Aussies call it? The, the management setup or leadership group. If Dhoni is not, st- if anybody thinks Dhoni is not part of the leadership group, they're hugely mistaken. I think. It was a whole different situation. I think at that... But there's a logic to it. And what, what Shastri said was that it was a joint decision taken by if Mahindra Singh Dhoni gets out against a new ball, batting at five, 
that's over because Pant and Pandya are not going to guide you for a chase of 240, whereas Dhoni will do it. And we, he did it along with Jadeja. He didn't. End, he, right? didn't he didn't. He didn't. got close. close. He didn't. And arguably, a lot of people are saying Jadeja ended up hitting the shot he did because Dhoni just wasn't keeping the score run, scoring rate ticking. So anyway, I think we should move on. You and I are not going to agree on this. Yeah, so we won't agree on it because there were a number of failures, right? I agree. And I was very clear. I said, I think... Everybody failed. I think I blame Rohit for not picking the hand up, but I don't blame him exclusively. I blame Kohli for messing up. I don't blame him exclusively. And I don't blame Dhoni exclusively either. Mm. But I but I do feel that he should have walked out earlier. Yeah, I mean, maybe in a parallel universe, he does walk out earlier and he gets out earlier and then we're done. Yeah, but maybe in a parallel universe, he walks out earlier, makes 50 of 72. And then you have Pandya and Jadeja who can both strike it over 100. And India is holding the cup right now. But what I'm trying to say again is that you, would, you wouldn't have made 50 of 72 in those circumstances, in those conditions, because that's not his game. And what I'm saying is, if he couldn't make 50 of 72 in the conditions where Pant made 30 of 60 and Pandya made 30 of 60, then he doesn't deserve to be in the 11. Okay, I'm not failing to see how he could score faster than people who were there at the time. 50 of 72 is a striker of 69. Pant made a striker of 58. So fine. Call it 50 of 80. Okay, fair enough. If he, could make, if he couldn't make 50 of 80 when Pant could make 32 of 56, then th- th- that's a huge problem. Fine, fine. So I think we're going to have to agree to disagree on this. Let's talk about Pant and Pandya, right? We talked about them steadying the innings. Why did they get out like that? What is, what is it with Rishabh Pant? The amount of talent he showed while studying the innings, in his innings of 30-odd. I mean, that shot to Mitchell Santner. Yeah, I, I, how, how do you explain it's, it? It's who he is. It's what you, we all three of us spent so many episodes, you know, just getting so frustrated at during the Delhi IPL campaign for Delhi because you've done all the hard work. You've played such an exceptional amount of cricket. And then when you least expect it, you play a silly shot that, you know, like somebody with the maturity of a child would hit and get out. And that's exactly what happened. I think Sandra bowled five dot balls and Pant just couldn't handle it. Now, arguably, had one of the top three stayed or even a Karthik, to be honest, or even a Dhoni come in at that point, you know, they would have had the experience or the temperament to walk over to him after five dot balls and say, hey, man, this is okay. We got time. We got to take it deep. Don't worry about it. But I think with Pandya on the other end, he's got a similar temperament. And that's where that fell short. So I think if a Kohli was batting with him or a Rohit even or a Dhoni, and some, you know, maybe the maturity would have been there just for the partner to walk over and say, don't worry about it, play out the maiden, it's okay. So that didn't work with Pandya because Dhoni was there and Pandya still went for that shot of Santner in the 30th over. Yeah, yeah, and maybe that's what you expect from players like Pant and Pandya, right? And maybe that's why people say your middle order can't have two players like that. You can have one. But maybe you need a little more stability in the middle yeah. order. And that's why Pant needs to bat at number one. I mean, he's Gilchrist. He's the Indian Gilchrist. I just send him out there. He's not going to hit the outfielders if there is nobody in the outfield. He keeps getting out caught in the deep. I mean, absolutely. If there are two fielders outside in the deep, he's not going to hit those fielders. I, I just anyway, I'm just really annoyed with the the way they've played Pant. I mean, it's it's been a shame. And I think he did very well. I mean, in this whole Dhoni debate, I think. What was lost is that Pant batted very well up to that stage. He counter-attacked, he counter-punched along with Pandya. Maybe that was some part of the plan of the team management saying, let's go out there, give these young guys a license to play without the worry of chasing the score or whatever. Who knows what Shastri was thinking? Yeah, I, I, I echo that. And I think credit to him and to Pandya to an extent for steadying the ship as best as they could. I think talent, there's no lack of talent, there's no lack of ability and clean striking. I think hopefully... For a 21-year-old with nine ODIs, something the temperament is something he learns. Right. And, and so we, when we lost Pandya, bit by bit, piece by piece, Jadeja came in. And I know you're a massive Jadeja fan. You've been a Jadeja fan for a long time, in test matches particularly. You do back him. I think last year when we did this podcast, you said that we'll see him in the World Cup. And boy, did we see him in the World Cup. Talk us through this Jadeja performance at the semi-final. Yeah, I mean, he bowled 10 overs, 1 for 34. Took just the one wicket, but was the most economical of all five bowlers. Uh, even more economical than Bumrah. So to me, that's really 75% of the job he's in the team for. So I was not expecting him to show up and put us in the hunt. I mean, to be totally honest, at 92 for 6, when we had lost both Pant and Pandya, I think we were all saying this game is done. And so 
credit to the partnership between Jadeja and Dhoni, credit to both of them to get it that deep. I mean, absolutely stunning knock, four sixes, and just took everybody apart, 77 off 59 balls. I feel really disappointed that it it, it was you know it got a little bit too much pressure for him at the end that he went for that big shot and got caught, hold, that hold out. But again, stunning knock. I mean, kept us in the hunt, got us to within... 18 runs off the off the target, but just well short. And if on another day, if one of the top three or Karthik, so any four of the top five batsmen had made even 20 runs, we would have been in a different place. So huge, huge credit to Jadeja. I think he's got a bright future ahead in the ODI setup. I feel bad for Kuldeep, who is exceptional in India and has been exceptional for the past couple of years. But it's going to be really interesting now to see how the three spinner dynamic shakes out in the future of ODIs and T20s for India. Yeah, and it was incredible. He just seemed to be batting on a completely different pitch from everyone else. He was dancing down the track and smashing people for huge sixes back over their head. He was hitting it very, very cleanly. We saw the sword dance come out after he got to his 50. There was a little bit of a shrug to the press box. I think Sanjay Mandrekar may have been squirming in his seat there a little bit. And I mean... After the depths of being 5 for 3 and 24 for 4 and 92 for 6, suddenly Indian fans had hope. You could hear the, you could hear the crowd getting back into it. We were, we needed about, I think it was 39 of the last three overs and it came down to, Jadeja got out, but Dhoni was still there and it came down to 25 of 10. And then, I mean, we've spoken about New Zealand's incredible fielding this tournament, Trent Bolt's catch and the their catching in the final. But I mean, what got them into this final, I think, at that stage, again, I would back Tony to get us home from 25 of 10 in, in a lot of situations, all by himself. And that throw from Guptil was, it was just a freak throw from deep square leg to hit one stump. I mean, Guptil's got two toes, right? Do you, do you know he only has two toes? But he had one stump to aim at. He only has two toes? I, yeah, thought, he I, had some, I thought I read somewhere that he's missing two toes. I think he's only got two of them. And he's. Uh, I think he's got the big toe and his last toe. I think he Jeez. lost them in an accident. Wow, I didn't know that. You learned something new every day, I guess. Yeah, so he, and he just threw the stumps down from... I mean, and Dhoni was caught inches short. And of course, I, he left it to the end, as is Dhoni's style. And... I mean, in some ways, he just left it, left the game in a situation that only Dhoni could win it from there. And of course, we didn't win it from there. So, yeah, we ended up losing the game by 18 runs. Uh, most of India went into depression. I know Varun couldn't sleep the entire night. I know we guys didn't really speak for like two days, just digesting what was happening. We stopped kind of watching the World Cup for a little while before the final. It was just... I mean, it felt really empty when we woke up. I don't know what, what what was your reaction to going out of the World Cup, Ashwin? How did you how did you deal with it? Yeah, you know, I think it first took a really really long time to sink in. I think even when it happened, there's something about the two days and people had taken time off on the first day, and then you came back the second morning and it started again, and it was just so bizarre the way it happened, including what you said about Guptil's run out from the boundary or from pretty far. So I think it took a really long time to settle in. When it finally did settle in. I think it was just surreal. Like you fought this hard, you've come into the semifinals undefeated. And then Virat Kohli summarized it best. Like we had seven weeks of great cricket, but we had 45 minutes of poor cricket. And it was at the worst 45 minutes. It was during the worst 45 minutes when it could happen. So I will say on a lighter note, it definitely helped to see Australia lose. I think that eased the pain a lot for me. It came back a little bit before the first ball of the final when the anthems were going on and the trophy came out. I just... Couldn't help but feel that that should have been India and that should have been Kohli out there. But definitely helped that Australia didn't make it. I know I'm sure you're happy about that given the bold declaration you made before the start of the tournament. But that that helped a little. Yeah, I wouldn't have minded an India-Australia final though. I mean, I wouldn't have minded India beating Australia in the final and avenging oh. 2003. But Oh, for sure. I'm just saying given India didn't make it, it was nice to see Australia fail out too. I totally agree. And then the Australians and the Indians ganged up on the English and were supporting the Kiwis <laughs> for the final, which is, which is pretty amusing to see. But I I also found that uh, all of a sudden, everyone uh, that I worked with decided to inquire about the Cricket World Cup uh, when India were five for three. And I was just like, it's been going on for six weeks, right? And now is the time that you find um, 
me to ask me how I'm feeling about cricket. I'm just like incredible. Is that is that British folks you're talking about? Yeah, British folks, Australian folks yeah, hadn't gone out by then, right? So they were still being cocky. Right. Yeah, of course. So yeah, they enjoyed it. Hey, I will say on a on a different note. I mean, the final that we had yesterday made news everywhere. I mean, I had lots of American colleagues of mine coming up and saying, wow, it was a pretty incredible game. Did you watch it? I read about it in the news. So pretty nice that given the quality of the final we had, it made news more broadly. Yeah, I totally agree. It was great for cricket. It was on free to air over here. So it was uh, being watched on terrestrial TV. And there was a screen set up in Trafalgar Square. There were screens in the markets here as well. So I think, yeah, it's... Um, controversial or not, the win, I think, is going to fuel the growth of cricket in, in England. And I mean, well done to them. They took a hard call after uh, the 2015 exit, after losing to Bangladesh. They said, we're going to play cricket in a certain way. And I mean, at the end of the day, the more boundaries they hit, that's what counted, <laughs> right? So, and English cricket is perfectly set up and excited for the 100 now, I guess. Absolutely. So this is all uh, ECB's master plan to promote the 100. <laughs> Anyway, coming back to coming back to Team India, right? So I just want to ask a last few questions on Team India before we move on to overall reflections on the World Cup. Ashwin, where do we go from here? Was firstly the run out the last we see of MSD? That's the first question. And secondly, I want to talk to you a little bit about captaincy because there's been some rumors floating around. So let, let's talk about MSD first. Is this the last we're going to see of him? You know, I, I feel bad saying this because he's a legend. He's an icon of the game. But I think I personally hope it is the last we see of him. I know he it's not the send-off he would have wanted. I still think we deserve to, you know, he deserves for us to all honor him, give him a, the send-off of an incredible icon of the game. But I think it's time to move on. So I hope it's the last we see. I don't think it will be, but I hope it's the last we see. I think he'll probably play a couple more series to try to end on a high note. I find that incredible. I, I just don't see why he'll play anymore. Yeah. I just can't see why he would do it. I mean, he may just play the West Indies or something to, you know, so so he can end on a high note. But yeah, I hope I hope he calls it. I just think if he was going to retire, he would have done it by now. But I was thinking today, you know, how good it would be for him to just transition into like a mentor role, like a non-playing member of the squad. He's just, he's an incredible strategic mind, right? So yeah. 100%, yeah. he would be a huge asset. Yeah, so like, I mean, Malinga played like a bowling coach or something for uh, Mumbai Indians for a season, right? When he was unfit and uh, all of that. So I just think like just... I think abandoning Team India would be very difficult because he plays such a big role in like field setting and stuff. But I think he needs to transition. Like you need to have a handover period where he may not be playing, but he should be in the capacity of a coach or a mentor or or something which just like passes all the know-how he's collected since his debut. I don't know how many ever years ago that it was. I mean, you have a, we have bowling coaches, batting coaches, and fielding coaches now. I think. You know, if there's anybody who can help train a your wicketkeeper and b your captain, it's Dhoni, mm. right? So, well, Sh- Shastri's uh, term is up, right? So maybe Dhoni can slip straight into that. That would be pretty fascinating. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm a big Dhoni fan, but I, I do hope now. I think I was hoping for him to go out on a on a big kind of uh, massive wave of success, but I don't see him lasting till 2020 T20 World Cup. Um, and I mean, a bilateral series is really meaningless for him to play. He doesn't play test matches anyway. So I think maybe another couple of seasons of IPL at most. And I think I think he's done. And yeah, we'll uh, we'll give him a farewell when he when he does decide to hang up his boots. But I don't think it's far off right now. So that's on MSD. Kohli's captaincy, Ashwin. Your your thoughts on that? I thought he did very well this World Cup. Uh, as captain, as leader. Yeah. But there's chat about split captains. There's already chat about Rohit taking over. I've dismissed those as baseless rumors, but is there any merit to that chat? Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. To be honest, I'm not sure where the chat is coming from. I think it's pockets of the internet and Twitter that's gone a little bit extreme with being Rohit fans and Virat fans, etc. I think Rohit and Virat get along. They're, you know, both great leaders and Rohit's vice captain, right? So they, they obviously team up together. Kohli has said publicly he relies on the opinions of Rohit and Dhoni before making his final decision. And so, I, I mean, I thought, honestly, I've been critical of Virat, the captain, before. I thought he did a pretty good job this time around. I, I'm not sure, back to the discussion we were having, I'm not sure how much he influenced the decision as to where Dhoni batted. 
if that was his choice and his choice alone, then I think that was a bad call. But I do think generally he's been a good captain. And I think, look, this is going to happen, right? The sad thing about the Indian media with a country of 1.25 billion people, this stuff happens. There'll be rumors, there'll be clickbait, there'll be news articles trying to get people to, or news channels trying to get people to watch them. I think we need to all take a little bit of time, reflect and move forward. And so I don't think there's too much to these rumors. Yeah, so the, the only thing I've seen are sources and I've seen like rumors circulating on social media seem to indicate that this is going to happen. But I can't see anyone taking the captaincy away from uh, Kohli if he doesn't want it to go, right? And uh, I think he'd be half the player, to be honest, if he uh, is the captaincy snatched away from him. If he wants to give it up to manage the workload, that's a different story. And I can see there a case being made for... Rohit taking over the T20 captaincy for the next big tournament and leaving Kohli to focus on the 2023 World Cup. But um, I don't see him giving up the one-day captaincy anytime soon because the next World Cup is in India. The hosts have won it the last three times, India in 2011, Australia in 2015, England in 2019. And I suspect Kohli has already set his goal for 2023. His eye is already on the prize and... Man, he's going to be doing some major gym work over the next few days just to get over that loss in the semifinals and eating some extra carrots. I don't know. I, I think, <laughs> I mean, the the other thing, right, is like, I mean, we've reacted so badly to this. How do you think the players feel? I mean, when I say we've reacted badly, we've reacted so emotionally because we're so invested in the success of this team. How do you think the players have reacted? Yeah, I, I, How they're dealing with it? Yeah, I'm sure they're absolutely gutted, right? So I think everybody needs to take a little bit of time. I mean, this morning was the first day in the wild that there's been no cricket going on and nothing really to look forward to. And I was okay with it. I mean, as a fan who doesn't spend nearly the kind of time or energy our players do. So I think they need a little bit of time. Obviously, being the Indian side, they only get just under two weeks off. But I think everybody needs to reflect. I think it must have been heartbreaking for the cricketers to fall so short. So let's give them a little bit of time. Let's give them some space. I know it's easier said than done, but I think it's a quality side. It was number one. ODI ranked is still number two by a distance. I think they're going to bounce back uh, harder and fitter than ever. Right. So we've got that. I'm sure there's a middle order that need fixing somewhere, but that's a chat for another day. If I hear the word number four anymore, I, I think I'm just going to throw up. I think I'm done with the number four. I think we wait at least a week and then we start dissecting <laughs> okay. again. One week then. I shouldn't Overall reflections on the World Cup. Last question before we wrap up this uh, World Cup rant. World Cup rant. I like that. Look, I, I think I think it was good. Good World Cup, good advertisement for the sport. I think those of us who are really close to the game will dissect a few different things. The first being format. I don't love that it was 10 teams. I think there's, you know, people complained about more teams being more one-sided games, but I think there were plenty of one-sided games and there were plenty of close games. So great quality cricket all around. I think... The second reflection I had is we didn't get even close to 400 run, let on the 500. So very interesting to see a World Cup with different sorts of pitches and that made it probably more closely fought with bat and ball than just being out and out hitting. And I think full credit to England for getting all the way with a sort of methodology that rewarded big big hitting and batting, but being able to pull out all the stops when, it, when they needed to with the ball. So great World Cup, I think fatigued, exhausted, all of us who watched it, traveled for it, watched every game, covered it, talked about it a lot, I think ready for a break. And then before we know it, we'll be fired up for India West Indies again. Absolutely. And I'm not sure I can actually add anything to that. As you said, the most interesting aspect of it for me was 250 was the new 350. And I thought it made for such exciting games. Uh, it had got a little boring just watching people smite the ball outside the World Cup. I think this World Cup was really the return of the bowler and the vengeance of the bowler. And we saw some really fantastic bowlers in action. I think Matt Henry was a revelation. Lockie Ferguson was a revelation. Bumrah was, of course, fantastic. Shami was great. Bhuvaneshwar for India was great as well. There was some excellent fast bowling from Jofra Arch. I mean, what a cricketer that guy is. Is he's already a world champion. I mean, he's 24. He's hardly been in the English side. I mean, really exciting times for, for world cricket and for fast bowling in particular. I really hope in like India can uh, recover from this quickly and bounce back. And I'm sure that they will. Uh, Indian fans need to keep supporting the team in, in times like this. I think it's easy to be a, a fair weather fan, as I said. Uh, it's times like this that we need to be more measured in our reactions and give players a break. I mean, 
they work really hard. They've done, they've tried their hearts out, right? And I mean, they've left everything that they had on the field. The fact that we got so close in a game where we were five for three, I mean, it just shows you what a class team we are. And I think we were very, very proud of the way India played this World Cup. And as a World Cup, I think it was a fantastic advertisement for the game. I think there will be people who have been inspired by this World Cup, like they were inspired by the 2001 Eden Test match or the 2005 Ashes. I think this World Cup will have uh, will live on in the memory for quite a long time. I think that's the World Cup wrap from us. We've really enjoyed talking about this World Cup. It's been really intense for us. We've uh, spoken to a lot of different people from a lot of different teams. We've had a lot of fun speaking to fans of different teams, covered all the games, all the big games. Uh, it's been a disappointing end for us, but I think India goes out with their held held high and we will be back next week with more cricket and possibly a little bit more about the World Cup as things develop. We'll see. Guys, as always, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We're at one tip, one hand. That's the number one tip, the number one hand. Get, send us an email. We're on contact at one tip, one hand. We love hearing from people. We're on Facebook and Instagram as well at the same handles as I mentioned earlier. We'll be back next week. Until then, this World Cup 2019 has come to an end with England champions and this is an Edges and Sledges wrap. Hey Krupa, check out my beatboxing. Boots and cat and boots and cat Man, and please boots stop. and cats. Alright, check out my singing. No, I'm serious, stop. But why? Because you're genuinely bad and because you've got actual talent to showcase. Presenting the ATKT Talent 10 podcast where I, Krupa and IP Man chat with some immensely talented college students about the fun part of college like Freshers Life, the music and poetry scene, side hustles for college students and the not so fun like weird dress codes, hostel deadlines and ragging. New episodes every Tuesday on the IVM podcast app, the IVM podcast website and wherever else you get your podcasts from. Hey Krupa, Check out my poetry. Roses are red. No. Violets no, are blue. No, 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 no. You are special. Please stop. Hey guys, I'm Mikhail Almeida. I host a, a podcast with my co-hosts Akash Mehta and Siddharth Dreja on the IBM app. It's called What a Player. What, what a, a Player. player. W A D D A P L A Y A H because illiterates can't find it on their own. No, and yeah. the her at the end is very important. What, what a, a Player. player. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and it comes out every Thursday on the IBM app. Uh, tune in, we discuss everything sports, uh, all sports. Uh, all, sports. all sports. Yeah. <laughs> Mainly cricket, other sport in the middle, sandwich. Thursday. <laughs> what happened to your language skills? Thursday. Don't worry, he talks better on the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so, a great show. It has all things, including cricket and uh, things around sports as well. Yeah. And some personal life. As you can see, we're a very united podcast. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to listen to us, tune in to us every Thursday on the IBM podcast app or ibmpodcast.com. <laughs> 